So you've seen Garretson's deliver lumber to my jobs before. But this time, I just got to point out this little red machine that rides around on the back of the delivery truck. It looks like a forklift, but it's called a Moffat. And these things are simply magic. And yes, it's a forklift, but in about the same way that a Leatherman is a pocket knife. And with an operator like Dylan in the seat of this thing, it will do work that you've just got to see to believe. So Ben and his youngest son, Asa, are helping me set up the first frames of scaffolding. You're going to see me use this stuff a lot on this job, and I'm counting on it to help me pull off some moves that I just couldn't do without it. Well, I think I'm mobilized. I've got the lumber staged in here just about right. It's gonna come in the right order. It's, you know, I've got it put in so I don't have to move a bunch of stuff twice, and that's important. I've got the tools on the job. Some of them need a little work. After the spec house project, they got a little bit of the life beaten out of them, but I think they're gonna serve at least one more time. So now that we're ready, I'm going to go get the hold downs that I need, some new washers for the anchor bolts, and start getting some lumber in the air. I'm gonna snap out the perimeter, five and a half inches in. This line and the two ends are essentially perfect. That stem wall varies from perfect to a quarter of an inch out. Okay, my bad. But I'm not a mason, I already told you that. So anyhow, we're gonna snap this out. We're gonna make these side lines perfectly parallel. The end is square, so we have very little to figure. We just need to make our five and a half inch marks, pull the chalk line, pop it, and get to work. So obviously, split face block is random out on that face, but the common block is seven and five eighths. So I'm gonna put a seven and five eighths inch mark right here and treat that as the outside of the world and come back five and a half inches from there to the inside of my bottom plate. Ditto right here. The bottom plate is pressure treated. It's in contact with concrete. Anytime you have wood in contact with concrete, you've got a spot for moisture, you've got a spot for bugs, you've got a spot for decay and dry rot and termites to start tearing your world apart. So you start with a pressure treated bottom plate. And in a case like this, where the um, end of the bottom plate is butting up against a masonry wall, you don't want to cut there. You want the factory end, which is also pressure treated, to be in contact with that wall. So I put my cut on the other end. I've exceeded the code spacing on these anchor bolts. A couple reasons for that. I want the inspector to be relaxed, and once you get the bottom plate in place, more anchor bolts tend to hold it straighter. This is not happening down below a floor system. This is at the inside of the building, and so this needs to be straight. Now beyond that, the code specifies that the anchor bolts at the end of the plate need to be within a foot of the end of the bottom plate. So I'm just gonna put a cut right here, the exact distance doesn't matter, then I'm gonna butt this plate to that cut and chop it off at the end of the world. So you can probably see that this bolt is out of plumb. If I had a piece of pipe, I would slide it down over there and just bend it back. I don't have any pipe on the job this morning, but I do have my little sledgehammer. So, start a nut so you don't mar the threads. And in this case, because I'm paranoid and because it's towards the end of this block, and I just don't want to break anything out of the end of this stem wall, I've got Ben pushing on this two by six, push on it, Ben. Backing it up right there, kind of a bucking bar is what this is called. And I'm just going to bring that back to plumb. That's great. Don't want to have a catastrophe just because you're trying to fix a small problem. So we have two different types of anchor bolts. We've got our hold downs, which are five eighths, and they stick way up in the world. We've got our half inch anchor bolts, which are within, you know, half an inch of being the same height. And on this particular wall, we've got two conduit penetrations. This is bringing the main power feed in. This is the Eufer ground, under footing ground. Um, this is a 20 foot piece of rebar that is entirely dedicated to providing the ground for the sub panel in the building. And this is a conduit bringing in the low voltage. I only tell you that because we can't use the Larry Hahn trick of simply setting the bottom plate on the anchor bolts, marking it with a hammer, and drilling it here. 
What we have to do is a little more tedious method of marking however accurately you think you need to do it. The sides of the bolts, bringing up a center mark, and getting ready to drill that. But the holes you drill for bolts don't have to fit tight. In fact, if you drill them tight, you're making a mistake. Drill the holes about an eighth of an inch bigger than the diameter of the bolt, so you've got a little bit of fudge factor, and it doesn't do anything to degrade the structural value of your ankle bolt. All right, we have one, two, three, four holes for the non-typical anchor bolts and penetrations. They're gonna work okay, pretty good. We've got three half-inch anchor bolts left, and those are the overwhelming majority of what we've got to deal with the rest of the way this morning. And most of those will be dealt with like this. Push the board down until it's in contact with the highest specimens. In this case, these two, mark, mark, tip this one down, mark. That is a lot easier than trying to square and mark and measure, and more importantly, it always fits. So remarkably, the board fits. The last thing I want to show you before I just forget about the camera and go to work is that underneath, between the bottom plate and the concrete, goes sill seal. I think I mentioned this, but this is what it is. It's some sort of a foam, six inches wide, or is that five and a half? It'd be better if it was five and a half. Yeah, it's five and a half inches wide. It's the same width as the board. It keeps air but primarily bugs from going back and forth into a building like this. And you just push it right down over the bolts. And visually just making sure it lines up with the line that we snap, and it does, we are beginning to build. Kelly and I lived in Powell, Wyoming from 1981 to 1986 or so. And I worked occasionally with a guy named Neil Peterson. He was a rough, brawny, sort of a, you know, just a classic production carpenter. In fact, he's the guy that showed me and impressed me with how well a rigging axe worked. But I remember him one time telling me that his rule was that they didn't have to call him until the concrete was all poured. He loved the framing, but not the forming. There is an excitement just under the surface when you're finally turned loose to build something. Now yes, it soon enough becomes sort of an endurance race, but at first, when you first scatter the boards and start to cut them and nail them together, it sure feels good to lunge out of the gate. Look at this scratch all that Kenny made me and brought by. Classic. Uses a grade eight bolt, turns down the pin, turns that ferrule out of brass, turns the wood. Beautiful. It's going on the mantle, not the toolbox. So sometime in the last, I don't know, four or five years, there was a change in the building code and a simple round washer will no longer do. Nowadays, these square plate washers, big, much thicker, and galvanized to boot, are required. Now they're nice all right, but I just gotta wonder, what's next? I'm going to gang cut the um, 13 of these things, which is just enough to put some uprights in. And I'm going to trust and try the new Makita. It doesn't feel quite familiar. Gang cutting is a good chance to wreck, I don't know how much this is, $150 worth of lumber, or at least commit it to a different purpose. But we're going to gird up our loins, grit our teeth, and take a chance.
I've got to say it came as almost a shock because ordinarily these hold downs do nothing but complicate my life. But this time I was delighted to figure out that throwing a couple of screws through these things and tightening them down actually did a pretty good job of holding these posts, these doubled studs, in place until I could secure them enough to actually get some work done. So these eight penny ring shanks galvanized, hot dip galvanized are the nails that I'm using to toenail into that bottom plate just so they don't rust away over time. I put the odd 16 penny in if it's in the gun and it's convenient, but I come back and make sure that toenails, two from each side, sometimes three if I'm feeling generous, are in place so that we don't have to worry about the connection down there at the floor. I've got about 10 hours, I think, in the lumber that you see on the ground and in the air back here. Now that's a long time, but I'm one man. And so I'm just kind of thankful to have these walls up and have a system going. The first short day was spent putting the plates down and detailing and drilling the holes and all of that. Tedious, slow. And then the second day, yesterday as it turns out, was spent sort of implementing a system I'd been trying to figure out for weeks, thinking about how to get 16 foot walls up one piece at a time by myself. Turned out it worked. Should get it pretty well wrapped up by the end of the day today. So I've got to just double down on this. These HD5s actually made this solo circus act possible. The crescent washers that came with these things tightened down on the plate and held these posts pretty darn plumb, like first time, and super securely. I mean, they, they held them tightly in a nearly plum position and I just could not have done this whole solo wall framing routine without them. So this one right here was pretty much the only anchor bolt that is just plain in the wrong spot. But it turned out to not be a big deal because that new blue Makita can do wood butchery with the best of them. So a little one-off building like this, I mean with the, with the various conditions of stem walls and turn down edge and anchor bolts and hold downs and, and which directions do the plates overlap and how are you going to stand this up, you know, by yourself, all those things mean that none of this is what might be thought of as industry standard, but it all uses industry standard processes and procedures that have to be adapted into each little sort of unique situation that you run into. That's so, that's so typical of construction and probably everything else in life, that you take whatever skills you've accumulated in the School of Hard Knocks previously and hopefully have enough facility to uh, apply them to what you're looking at in a minute. I like to think of this as suspending a problem in your brain and rotating it. Don't just suspend the problem in your brain and look at it and stare at it and stare at it, but rotate the problem and look at it from every, every angle that you can sort of generate. And sometimes if you stick with it long enough, you're going to come up with something better. And sometimes you're just going to work yourself into a lather for no reason when you should have just started with the standard first intuitive process and worked. But I guess it takes time to figure that out and we never get it right all the time. So with this stuff standing up behind me, I'm going to cut the studs for this wall that's sitting on top of the stem wall. I'm going to put the layout on here and I'm going to show you what 
most of you are aware of and some of you have wondered about, and that is the setback on a 16-inch on-center layout. So when you're laying out your bottom plates, you're committing yourself to the future location of the studs. The studs will sit on the bottom plate, the top plate, which is this board, will sit on top of this, and the plywood and the siding and the drywall and everything that attaches to the skin, the diaphragm on the outside or the inside of the wall, is going to be anchored to those studs. I mean, that's, for, that's uh, wood framing 101, right? But if that's where you're at, wood framing 101, sometimes it's a question mark about, gee, 16 inch on center. Do I put the edge of the stud at the 16 inch? Do I put the far edge? Where do I put the stud? So the thing that controls that is the width of the material. And on the west coast of the United States, and the United States generally, and maybe in other places, most sheet goods are 48 inches wide, 96 inches long. That's a multiple of 16 inches in an imperial world. And so, let me just mark on here where the plywood, in this case OSB, is going to be stopping, okay? I have it flush on the end of the plate down there. If I were going to be putting this sheet up, let's say, day after tomorrow, I want the edge of that sheet to break in the center of a stud. There's the mark at the edge of the sheet. You just saw me do it. What that means is the stud needs to happen right there, okay? with the center of the sheet and the center of the stud. So that tells you that any way you can remember and sort of be able to identify that location while you're moving quickly, and by the way, you should be able to learn to move quickly and do this, that's gonna dictate how you mark your plates. If you hook your tape at the end of the plate, if you're working from left to right, I like to work from right to left, but that end down there is tangled up with that other wall. 48 inches means you hold back three quarters of an inch and mark 47 and a quarter, or you hold a head three quarters of an inch and mark 48 and three quarters, and those are the edges of the unit, okay? Now that's not a big deal, except sometimes you forget. Now, let me muddy the water. I'm gonna put half inch sheeting on the outside of that wall. It makes no difference at all, but if you are OCD enough to want the edges of your sheets to come to a perfect 90, that is one of the sheets run by the thickness of the wall sheeting, then I might want to run the end of my tape down there another half an inch to accommodate the thickness of the sheeting on the face of the wall. If I was gonna do that, then this whole thing would transfer back another half an inch. So each situation is different. Every wall may have a different um, sheeting specified for shear strength or you know any number of other reasons. But in general, if you bury, that is, hold back three quarters of an inch or run ahead three quarters of an inch, when you start putting up your plywood or hanging your drywall on the inside, you're not going to be disappointed about that anyway. So now that we know that that is the center of the sheet, that's where we want everything to break, that's where we want the backing, we can just take our handy dandy framing square or whatever method you want and mark one side or the other or both or you might use a system where you just make a mark and go, make a mark and go, or you might use a system where you make a crow's foot and an X, whatever it is that you're comfortable with, whatever it is you can remember, and more importantly, the guy coming behind you can identify correctly, that's what you gotta do. I'm gonna lay this out cut however many studs it's going to take, probably about 30. Roll the scaffold over here and see if I can hang one more wall up in the air on almost nothing at all. Now when I was a kid, like a little kid, I loved to climb tall trees. And as a young man, I liked to go rappelling you know, hanging off a rock with a rope. And for years I've enjoyed, or I used to enjoy, elk hunting in the mountains wherever I lived. But as an old carpenter, getting up off the ground and pushing the limits of safety to do a job that you really ought to be doing with somebody else helping you is about as close as I ever get to an extreme sport. But I like it. It makes me feel like I'm still alive and like I can actually produce most of a day's work.
So I've been at this three hours. Got to subtract some time for phone calls and for for uh, tending a camera. That's that's a time burner. So let's just say you know two and a half hours. It's not terrible. Two guys would have done it maybe in an hour. But for the 30 minute difference, I don't feel too bad about about not having to keep somebody busy for the rest of the day and then worry about what I'm gonna do with him tomorrow. Sometimes one guy's the way to go, but you gotta have a nail gun and it sure helps to have some rolling scaffold. So it looks like the first really big framing challenge is gonna be dealt with pretty soon. There's gonna be a few more, but frankly, I'm looking forward to solving those puzzles. There's not much in life that feels better than looking back at the end of the day and feeling the satisfaction of having accomplished something worthwhile. Something that maybe was a little too hard and was intimidating. Something that's going to make a positive difference in the lives of some of the folks around you. Maybe, maybe it's something that just had to be done and you were just the guy to do it. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work.